Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Leaders in athlete sweat testing and hydration with multi-strength electrolytes that match how you sweat. You can get 15% off with the code OxygenAddict15. Cool. Team Oxygen Addict. Event-specific training plans, coaching guidance from Coach Rob Wilby and supportive teammates in a private Facebook group. And tgstore.co.uk which is the home of premium sportswear, including gore bikewear, gore running wear, and aquasphere wetsuits. You can get 10% off with the code OxygenAddict10. And a big thanks to our patrons who support the show. And this week, we've got to say thanks to Lee Cramp, who's become a new patron. And you've got to go check out his photo hells over on the patrons page. Is it funny? It's the, it's the best one I've ever seen. It's, it's a baby with an Iron Man finishes medal around his neck. It's just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely love it it's the cutest thing you've ever seen i will check nice work out. lee <laughs> so how are you hells welcome to the show thank you thank you yeah uh rocking rob i'm just i'm just counting down to the end of january and then i think life will be normal again you're getting through it are you i'm getting through it that is the only word the only few words to describe it i think i told you last week it was work heavy and it sort of stayed yeah. that way but we're nearly i'm nearly there I, I always think, like, get yourself out of January and all of a sudden you can start to see light at the end of the tunnel. The first week of February, you have that, oh, look at this. The days are definitely, it's a bit lighter today. It's getting oh, a bit lighter. Yeah. Summer's coming. And by, like, mid end of February, you definitely, you're on the way to it for sure. So this next week, I think, is, I don't know whether they call it, like, Black Monday or something because it's like, oh, it's been dark think, forever. Think, yeah, I think we've had that one already. I got through that. That was fine. They're all Black Monday. They're all been Black Monday in January. But anyway, February, they'll be like happy, sunny, yellow Mondays. Yeah, they will. Racing season's on the way. People are getting fit. So come on, everyone. Dig in. Get the training done now. Get the rewards in the summertime. Yeah, love it. Ah, right. Let's jump right in and let's go. Let's go to our news section first for this week. Our news is sponsored by TGStore.co.uk. Um, I've had the old Gore bike jumper out this week, Helen. I've got a Windstopper Gore jacket yep. that is my official. It's chuffing freezing, <laughs> and it's so warm that unless the temperature's below like two degrees, yeah. you can't wear it. You overheat and you end up cycling with it flapping down around you around your waist but on the days when it's cold it's you just perfect ah oh, they should make full body clothing out of it for the winter time i tell you it's brilliant yeah, i'd be sorted wouldn't i with that you you need it mate yeah. I, I might lend it you actually and see <laughs> you try it out <laughs> any activity that involves getting cold because the wind that gore windstopper stuff is just awesome at warming you up i love it i must admit rob the, it is, the, it's absolutely brilliant the, the weather was so uh, delightful this weekend i did actually crack the hand warmers out again did you? Did you get the old the old hot hand warmers under your gloves? Yep, did amazingly. Kept me going on my nice little run um, yesterday. It started snowing. Wasn't expecting that. Is that, that. right? Yeah. Really? Yeah, really. Honestly. I was up um, I was up in Lancaster this weekend running a coach education course for British Triathlon, and we had this really cool building with a brand new 25 meter swimming pool, and looking out over you know, Lancaster University has got this beautiful campus, yeah. and it just looked chuffing freezing outside and i was like i'm so pleased we're doing swimming for the assessments this weekend we don't have to go out there you imagine what it's like standing outside for three hours with a clipboard assessing people's like cornering <laughs> yes i can imagine that because i sort of yeah yeah I, I, I did a few little skill sessions last year on a freezing cold tennis courts yeah. and um yeah i was there in ski oh, trousers because it was that cold yeah so that's coming i've got two months until the second weekend this time so hopefully the uh, the other tutor tony said to everyone well hopefully we might get a warm spring and who knows it might be warm in march and i was thinking yeah or it could be snowing so we'll wait and see <laughs> oh we? rob i'll tell you i'll tell you what i've entered for march the Go um on. well you know we did a report with them last year open five Oh yeah, yeah. I've entered the one in March, um, which is in Shropshire. So is this it the is the Shropshire one on the yeah. long end. Yeah. So this is the um, sort of you have a five hours, and basically you split your time between mountain biking, which I'm utterly crap at, and running. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I'm just thinking, like, I love Shropshire, but I'm just picturing a very, very cold, snowy, long mind. But no, can't it'll wait. be brilliant. It's going to be, be great, really, isn't really it? good. Yeah, yeah. And you'll feel like you're out in the middle of the wilds as well. The long mind's awesome, isn't it? Yes. So if anyone fancies something a little bit different uh, in a couple of months' time in the UK, uh, check out Open Five with their series. A load of fun, and you get a good, good day of training in. Is that? Do you know what weekend it is off the top of your head? Fourth, fifth of March. Is it really? Yes, oh, it is. I've got, I've got nothing on that weekend. I might come and join the come and have a scamp around. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun, actually. There you go. Do it. Nice. Do it. Right, should we start with some news, Rob? Yes, let's start with the lovely Gwen Jorgensen, shall we? Yeah, because this is the uh, big news this week, is that uh, Gwen Jorgensen is pregnant, which is really exciting for her and her husband, um, Patrick Lemieux so that means that she is obviously going to put uh, her triathlon plans on hold this season but she still very much has her eyes on um, Tokyo 2020 in the Olympics and she hopes to return to competition in 2018 so their baby is due in August. That's some pretty decent planning isn't it get to the end of the Olympic cycle now I'll have a baby okay there it goes <laughs> move on to the next thing. <laughs> Very impressive. Good good work, Gwen. Well, she's seen and, and Nicholas husband. Beerig do it as well, hasn't she? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, good so stuff. That's cool. Um, and then, Rob, another thing that I saw was that one of Team GB's um, track athletes, Beth Potter, is going to be making a switch from like pure running and athletics to triathlon and she's moved to Leeds um, she reached the so she, she ran in the 10,000 metres uh, final in Rio uh, apparently Johnny Brownlee is renting a room to her she used to be a very very good swimmer when she was younger um, in Scotland so really yeah. it's the cycling that she's going to have to you know work very very hard on but That'll be, uh, see how she goes. I think she says she's going to give it like maybe six to 12 months and see how she fares. Um, and yeah, hopefully, you know, if she wants to go to a second Olympics in triathlon, brilliant. And if not, then I think she's, I think she's a former teacher. So she said there's a lot of other stuff that she can go and do, but that's kind of cool, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. I fancy having a crack at that and I'm going to shoot for the Olympics. Why not? Exactly. So good luck um, with the switch. And then over in the warmer climbs, we've got we've had a few weeks without any sort of real race information, haven't we? So this weekend we've got both seventy point three Dubai and seventy point three South Africa happening. And uh, the thing that's interesting for me is that Monsieur Gomez is going to be, or Senor Gomez is going yeah, to be Senor. racing in Dubai. Yes, that's right. Uh, we mentioned it the other week that he is basically racing there to hopefully stamp his, you know, entry for the 70.3 World Championships in Chattanooga. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to watching him uh, to go. I don't know who else is racing in this one actually. Whether there's going to be a, you know, sort of a not a stacked field exactly, but oh, here we go. We've got Terenzo's racing as well. Andreas Dreitz, Joss Amberger, Tyler Butterfield, Michael Rayler, Tim O'Donnell, Martin Jensen. So it's a decent field, isn't it? Yeah. So it'll be, it's cool, isn't it? It's always fun seeing, you know, the, the first sort of big races of, of the of the year, really. Mm. And it's super early, isn't it? January for for people who live in North America or who live in Europe. It's dead, dead early to be racing in the year. So you never know where the people are going to turn up absolutely on fire with fitness because they've trained all the way through from the back end of last year yeah. or whether they're just kind of turning up to, to ease themselves around an event and maybe have a bit of a holiday down in Dubai in the sun at the same time I don't think Gomez will be doing that <laughs> no well you don't know do you I'd, I'd be very surprised if he was in peak shape though in all seriousness yeah that's it's true he's probably not going to be in peak shape but then you know because of his injury last year obviously he's not going to be in peak peak shape but he might actually be looking all right mm. in Dubai because he yeah. couldn't, you know, he, he won't have smashed himself silly out in Rio because he couldn't. Um, and obviously he wants to get the qualification out of the way. Yeah. Um, we do, however, know that Terenzo's in spectacular form, don't yeah. we? Yeah. After his back-to-back -back wins just before Christmas. And he's, 
he's traditionally done very well at this time of year hasn't he obviously yeah. with with being a southern hemisphere athlete they're in the peak of their season down there so um so yeah it's an interesting one for mr gomez that isn't it that if he turns up and, and he's in anything other than good shape you've got the southern hemisphere athletes just firing on all cylinders yeah i know he's been training very recently in la santa and then before that he was training out in new zealand for a little bit as well Gomez. Well, that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, he won um, one of the New Zealand 70.3s, didn't he? That's right, yep. I've lost track now. There are so many of them. Which it was one a it was. small one. Yeah. It was a small a bit one. Of a bit tune kind of up for this, was it? For him? Yeah, totally. Like a training race. <laughs> Daniela Reef and Caroline Stefan both on the start list yep. for the ladies. So let's see whether they, uh, whether they both show up. That's it. Reef's been training out in Cyprus as well in the sunshine. So, yeah, it'll be good. Good stuff. Okay, let's uh, let's the last bit of news actually is a bit sad, isn't it? Matt Troutman in a bike accident a couple of days ago. Yeah, I noticed that on um, on Twitter, Rob. He um, he got knocked off his bike. Um, he's had surgery, and the doctors seem quite pleased with the way it's gone. So we will keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, that... wish him all the best. He got run into from behind, from what I read. Mm. Someone drove into the back of him when I was out on his bike, and. <sighs> He had some kind of, you know, I can't remember exactly what I read. Some kind of back injury, didn't he? Was it a, a fra- yeah. Was it a fracture that mm. it said? Or yeah, poor guy. So, all the best to you, Matt. Hope you uh, hope you get well soon. Definitely, the, Rob. The other person who we needed to give a shout out to in terms of similar was Heather Fell, who we had on the show, um, former GB modern pentathlete. She was going to be doing Ironman South Africa this year. She's been yeah. training out in South Africa, got knocked off her bike, uh, oh, no. yeah, out there as well. So um, recover. I know she's 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 okay, but I think um, yeah, never good. Uh, I think no, a few broken. Not, no, a few broken. I don't know. I think I think there might have been plaster somewhere. Oh, oh, maybe. Bless her. Yeah. Oh, well, hope you get well soon as well then. Yeah, not good. Should we move on? Stay to... safe out there, kids. Absolutely. Should we move on to Coach's Couch, Rob? Yeah, do it. I've got a good question from Tim Barrett this week. Yeah, okay. So Tim says, when doing a long ride outside um, and I want to stay in zone two, power, what should I have on my Garmin screen as I find three's power fluctuates too much? Yeah, so it's three second power. Um, that thing, three second power fluctuates right, too that much. Was, okay, that's what I didn't get. I was a bit like, hmm, what? Yeah, okay. yeah, sure. So, so when you when you're riding with a power meter, you can have different um, different little metrics up on the Garmin screen, and uh, obviously, as you're producing power as you're riding, at different even at different points in one pedal cycle, you'll be producing different amounts of power. So the clever Garmin head unit does some maths and tells you what the average is at a given time so the first thing is like if you have instantaneous power on the screen it just jumps around all the time because at any point in that you know as just as your legs going round, you'll be producing no power at one point in the cycle and loads of power at another point in the cycle and so that number's almost completely useless so the standard sort of smallest number people look at is the three second average which kind of levels that number out a little bit and gives you something that your brain can make sense of so that's what he means by three second power um but as he's seen even that three second power number jumps about all over the place and it isn't really particularly useful um and then the issue is if you're going out and you want to do a, a three-hour ride and your coach has said i want you to ride this in zone two or you know like say 70 to 75 percent of your ftp and you've got this one number on your screen and mm. it's jumping from 13 watts to 287 watts and back again it's you know it's literally no use to you at all so the garmin's got the option to have three second average 10 second average 30 second average um and all different kinds of averages that basically make this number a bit more constant on your screen yeah. Um, so that's the first thing. There's a, there's a real art to reading the Garmin as you're riding with a power meter. It's not as easy as just kind of going right. I'm going to ride at 200 watts and you know using it like a speedometer on a on a car you would do. So you've got to have different numbers on the screen and compare the different numbers to each other and get in the habit of doing this really quickly so that you know what's going on. So my advice to people is on your Garmin screen have three second power, ten second power, thirty second power and lap average power 
all in four little different data boxes. And as you look down at your Garmin, get in the habit of comparing those four numbers really quickly and obviously then looking back at the road. Um, and you'll need to look at the screen for a couple of seconds to make sense of it. But in general, the 10 second power and the 30 second power number are the ones that are most useful because the 10 second power kind of stays relatively steady and tells you what's going on now and the 30 second power tells you what's going on over the last 30 seconds so if you compare those two numbers to each other really quickly you can get a sense of the trend of whether you're pedaling a bit harder now than you were over the last 30 seconds or whether you've eased off a bit at the moment compared to the last 30 seconds so yeah those two numbers are kind of the what's going on now number but the most useful thing to do is the Garmin's got an option to have a lap average power. And so, you know, when you press the sort of lap split button on your yep. watch or your Garmin, my advice to my athletes is you've got to start using your Garmin like that. And any time the terrain changes, press the split button on your Garmin. So if you start to go up a hill, press the split button. And then that lap average box is going to tell you what the power's doing as an average since you started this change of terrain. So if you're going up a hill, it's going to say to you, right, since you started the hill, your average power is 300 watts. And if before the hill you were riding an average of 200 watts, you know that you're riding too hard on the hill. So that's essentially what it's useful for, telling you you're going too hard up the hill, which we all know that we do, but it's good to see that number in front of you. So, you know, if, you, if you're looking at that lap average and it says 300 and you know that before when you were riding along on the flat, you were riding at 200, you know you've got to back that off significantly to bring the 10 second and 30 second power back down to the same level where you want it to be. Same if you go into a headwind, same if you go over the brow of a hill and you start to go downhill. Obviously, you can't push the same kind of power out going downhill, but it just gives your brain something to relate the number back to, to think, OK, I'm not I'm not burning matches all the time. I'm not needlessly wasting energy every time, you know, the, the, the terrain or the wind or the weather changes, essentially. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. It's kind of hard to. I think people think the power meter is going to be a magic bullet. And in some ways it is like looking at the data afterwards is super useful. But when you first get it, it's easy to get it and go, oh, man, I've just spent you know, several hundred quid on this thing. And it's like a random number generator. I can't make any sense of it. Mm. So you have to accept there's a learning curve and there's an art to reading it. A bit like that, that dude in the Matrix who's sitting there looking at the screen. <laughs> You've got to learn how to read the numbers and what sense they make compared to the other numbers and compared to what's happened over the last half a minute the last five minutes so you get a sense of you know whether you're the kind of athlete who gets excited when somebody overtakes you and you try and keep up with them whether you get out of the saddle and pretend you're a tour de france cyclist when you're going uphill but the power meter is going to tell you that and and if the answer is well i enjoy you riding like this well well fine but you're not kind of using the power meter in the way it's intended which is to stop you being daft essentially yep you know yeah it does make sense now rob you know i don't have a power meter and i have right. never ever <laughs> that's right <laughs> but i have never <laughs> cycled with power but the only thing that i can even semi relate it to is in training peats when i upload my heart rate uh, mm -hmm. data and it says in there you know you peaked for 10 seconds at this heart rate or this heart rate or this heart rate and you can see exactly. there in those moments, oh, I clearly got a little bit overexcited at that point because, you know, for five seconds, whatever, I was at yeah. this particular high heart rate. And, and that's the way I can relate it. Oh, well, it is. It's, it's just like that. Only heart rate takes probably five to ten seconds to respond after the terrain changes. So if you're going up a hill that, you know, is like a short, steep, rolling hill... You, you'll look down at your heart rate and probably nothing much has changed even though you're out of the saddle and you're pushing what in reality is loads more power your heart rate won't actually change and then 10 seconds later if you look back down your heart rate will be climbing and then as you go over the top of the hill your heart rate won't level out quite as soon as you go over the top of the hill because it's still like catching up to the effort you've just made yep. whereas the heart rate where the power meter sorry is going to tell you the instant you start putting that power out, it's going to go, Helen, stop being daft. Stop being naughty. <laughs> it's like a naughtyometer. That's what it is. I like it. 
<laughs> you see, that's the way in with you. I've got to, I've got to find a way to convince you it's a fun thing to use rather than go, oh, it's really scientific and technical. It's a naughtyometer. It's going to stop you being bad when you're out on your bike. <laughs> I'm sure it's fun, but you know, you know me. Um, Rob, we did yeah. have a quick question from Eamon Betts, right? And I reckon we can go into more detail on this um in another show yep. but just can you just sort of explain very very briefly the difference between ftp vo2 yep. and lactate threshold right the difference between ftp vo2 and lactate threshold so first up that phrase lactate threshold there is about 20 different descriptions of what it means and everyone's going to have it mean something slightly different but in easy layman's terms, FTP or functional threshold power is going to be the power that you put out at your lactate threshold heart rate. Does that make sense? Yep. So lactate threshold and FTP are essentially the same thing. So at the FTP is the power you'll be putting out as you're riding along at threshold. And VO2 is a measure in the laboratory of the maximum volume of oxygen that your muscles can suck out of your blood when you're exercising maximally, essentially. So that's a concept that's much more difficult to understand. But in terms of if you're riding with a power meter, what we can sort of say is we can give you a number for the kind of power that you'd be putting out at VO2 max. So to a certain extent, you're born with a certain ability with your muscles to take oxygen out of the blood at a certain rate. And it's a little bit trainable, but largely it's genetic. So a guy like, I don't know, um, Lance Armstrong or Greg LeMond were born with this massive ability to suck oxygen out of the blood and into their muscles. And other people were born with a not particularly great ability to suck oxygen out of the blood into the muscles. And so you've got this firstly this inbuilt ability, and then you've got the ability to, you know, train it a little bit, and then you've got the ability to train the amount of power you can put out whilst you're maximally exercising like that. So it isn't that relevant to triathletes in terms of training at that level. VO2 mm-hmm. max is it's much more about a sort of a five minute effort really. You know, that that it's a a really good predictor of how good a 1500 meter runner you're going to be, if you like. Yeah. Not that relevant at all to to triathletes in terms of training that intensity. But if you've been born with with an innate ability within your muscles to suck out whatever oxygen's in there and into your muscles really quickly, that obviously gives you a really good advantage in any kind of sport, doesn't it? Absolutely. Well, there we go. Eamon, hope that helps. I hope that's answered. Probably it's just confused people even more. No, it's complicated. It is. <laughs> I I think you explained it well, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, there we That's go. Very kind of you. Hopefully, it's helped. If not, shoot us an email, and I'll see if I can send you some documents over that'll help explain it. Perfect. Uh, Rob, should we move on to some talking points? Yeah, so we've got a few things to chat about this week and we want to give a shout out because we haven't got any race results this week to do. This section is going to be sponsored by our friends Precision Hydration, who you'll have heard us talking about in previous shows. Uh, They sell fantastic electrolyte supplements. And for people like me who are extremely salty sweaters, they can be a lifesaver. For people like Helen, who are normal sweaters, they can really help maintain the natural level of electrolytes in your blood. And they are offering to go around to clubs and squads at the moment and do one of their road shows, aren't they, Helen, that we've had on the last couple of shows? Yeah, correct. And it is a really cool way to learn a little bit more about why it matters, why it's important, and just, you know, it might actually be of benefit to you during a race come and during your training in the year as well. I think so, especially if you're a if you're a long distance athlete, especially if you've suffered really badly with cramps in a race, especially. And if you found yourself at the end of a long distance race in the heat in the medical tent being very sick, like I did lots of times, it it could be incredibly important and it could be the key thing that, that is missing from your race strategy. Um, so go back and listen to the couple of episodes we've just put out, episodes 108 and 109, which has got Helen being sweat tested. And then if you fancy getting them down to your club to do some kind of club event where they'll come and do testing for you, get in contact with them through their website, which is Precision Hydrate. Com. Cool. 
So, Rob, we opened a whole can of worms, la- worms last week, and I don't think you even intended to do it. I think it's just... <laughs> Let's be clear here that the can opening was you, Helen. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a can there, and you opened it. Let's be clear on this. <laughs> so, last week's interview, Rob introduced as an elite age grouper. And this was Gareth. And Gareth, again, I'm going to maintain your blooming awesome age grouper and I'm also going to point out that <laughs> Gareth never called himself an elite age grouper that was poor Rob Gareth. Poor, poor Gareth poor Gareth me afterwards and he was like I'm on Helen's side with this one I never said I was an elite age grouper it was you that said that I was like I just meant that you were fast that's all so never never has one word polarized an audience as much as this twitter went on fire over this didn't it oh right nick got in touch saying controversial one similar subject um they've just introduced an elite wave at outlaw holcomb half will be interesting to see the criteria jane handsome who we've had on you know a really really super duper kona winner um in an age group she was like no just don't go there Dave, I'm sure it exists in the mind of some age groupers. Mark says, if you are if you are described as an elite athlete, then you should be with the pro wave. Um, who else? Uh, Ruth Perbert got in touch. Yeah, agree. Think there should be age groupers and then pros. Um, Kerry McGauley says there are definitely competitive age groupers out there who want to race head-to-head rather than pesky rolling starts. Uh, yeah, Hal, that's a really good... Let's come back to that. That's a yeah. really, really good point. Hal said, you can also be amateur elite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not like Hal to try and start steering things up, is it? <laughs> oh, ben, <laughs> got in, ben got in touch saying there definitely is um, such a thing as an elite age grouper. It's the equivalent of your Cat 1 cyclist or non-league footballer. Um, some get more backing than weaker pros. Um, then if you eat, train, recover and perform at the top of the field, then you are elite. Some just can't justify going pro. Being a very good age grouper is the only option. That was from Matt Mills. Um, Alistair said yes, and they deserve the same tag because they're so fast. They're sponsored. They've got travel kit, nutrition, spares, gym, insurance, all those perks of being elite. Um, you see, this is this is, comes down to what people's understanding of what the phrase elite age group means, doesn't it? Because some people have got one understanding of it. And then I've used this phrase, Gareth is an elite age group, just meaning he's really good. And, and he hasn't got any of that stuff. You know what I mean? He's got me lending him a vest to race in. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, Rob, I'll just bring in a couple of, because we also got a couple of pros who did get in touch so kit walker said i have a pro license but don't consider myself a real pro yet there are some age groupers out there with more more pro lifestyle but good on them brad williams says there needs to be an elite age group division as a stepping stone to the pro ranks or a pro am division he says there is enough talent out there um for it to at least exist at regional and championship level races um Do you know brad williams is a really interesting example here yeah, because exactly. he's he's living in the uk and he's come over from america we do you know i've had him lined up for an interview a couple of times and haven't made it work so this will be a kick in the bum for me to to actually get in contact with him again he's finished top 10 in several of the uk 70.3s and he got some real abuse on twitter replying to this did you see those there were some there were some people giving him some real like you know oh yeah so you're a pro are you kind of thing Mm. and i thought he responded really professionally to them there was people who were just clearly just having a pop at him and being really rude and i wouldn't have been as polite as he was towards them but his point was look i'm giving it a go i'm stepping up and doing the best that i can and and who can't respect that you know he's not going around going i'm the great i am but he's managing to finish top 10 in a 70.3 and so yeah it's it's really really challenging isn't it yep yep and there are loads more comments besides but i won't go into all of them now but i know that um we retweeted quite a lot of them and it did seem that there was almost like a 50 50 split of people like me who are just like what what a load of rubbish that doesn't exist and then other people say well you know it does and it should i think it's it's difficult for the really good age group as well um i thought like for example i think it's great that the outlaw half are doing 
if we're going to call it an elite age group wave or a fast age group wave or whatever but like last year it, it came down didn't it to a couple of seconds at the finish and it was reese barkley was one of them and i can't remember unfortunately who the other one was but they were in different waves yeah. and there was only seconds between them at the finish and effectively they were denied their opportunity to race head to head because they were in different waves so obviously the organizers of the race have addressed that this year and thought we could get a fantastic race out of this mm. but I think there's a lot of, you know, like the very fast age groupers would be really into the idea of racing each other because let's take Hal Davis for an example. He's he's my age, so he must be 44 this year. And yet he's still fast enough to finish top 10 overall at something like the Vitruvian. But if he goes in the 40 to 44 category or the 45 plus category, he could potentially be setting off 25 minutes behind other age categories and have to ride through hundreds of people on the road, you know? Yep, yep. So not really yeah so anyway my apologies once more to gareth for calling you that but it's uh i'd be interested to see how this plays out and what what people's opinions are after races like the outlaw this year hells where they get the opportunities to uh to race head to head yeah yeah well it's, it's definitely one to follow and i don't think it'll you know I, I do think that a couple of races probably will do that and introduce yeah i think you're dead right I think you're dead right. Well, listen, let's go over to this week's interview. We've got a fantastic interview lined up this week with Sarah Piampiano, American pro who's finished seventh in Kona two times. And um, if you haven't heard her backstory before, it's absolutely brilliant. She certainly does not have the traditional lead into a professional triathlete's lifestyle. Sarah, welcome very much to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me and happy new year. Are you in sunny California right now? I am in rainy California, yes. Oh, it's raining. (laughs) I feel so much better. (laughs) Yeah, we've been getting uh, some pretty big storms actually coming through Northern California, which is where I am. And actually yesterday morning we woke up and we were both, my my boyfriend and I were both looking out the window and we saw a huge tree come crashing down onto somebody's uh, somebody's car and crush the car. (laughs) Oh, that's scary. It's been quite stormy here, yeah. Oh, well, I'm sitting here looking at your, your photo on Skype, which is you riding in the sunshine, and I was feeling very jealous, oh. but I don't feel quite so bad now. Yeah, no, it's actually, it can be quite cold here. This last week, it was down around um, zero degrees Celsius, uh, maybe a little bit warmer, maybe two or three. Uh, so it's pretty pretty cold, yeah. and we're all looking forward to going to Hawaii in a few weeks for our training camp. Oh, not jealous at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so listen, I want to start off by by telling the listeners sort of who you are and what you've done because I've had a good read through your uh, your website and your blog and stuff today and there's some there's some amazing results in there. Um but I'm just kind of going to give them the greatest hits from this year which will give them a really good flavor. You were 7th overall female at Kona, Ironman Hawaii. You were 3rd at Western Australia where you went 8:58 and broke the magic 9 hours. And you were the winner of Ironman Vineman in California, as well as multiple other wins as well across the season. So we've got a brilliant set of results there. And obviously top 10 in Kona is a fantastic result for any pro. But then we get to your backstory. And the first thing it says on your website is, um, I came to triathlon late. I was smoking two packs a day and working 16 hours in a finance office. So I thought... Well, this isn't going to be the standard interview with a with yeah. a professional triathlete. So, that's yeah. quite a transformation. Yeah, it is. And um, you know, I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be a professional triathlete. I I, I did grow up doing sports, and I was actually a very elite runner. Um, and I did have high aspirations of going to the Olympics and running or, or downhill ski racing, which is um, the other sport that I that I competed in a very high level. But um, you know, I didn't even really know what a triathlon was until quite quite late in my life, and I um, had transitioned out of um, competing at a high level and competing um, in collegiate collegiate sports. Um, and I was working on Wall Street, and it was a it was a very high stress, uh, extremely demanding job. And um, I just sort of went down the path of not sleeping very much, partying too hard, and also smoking cigarettes, and, and not actually working out at all. I mean, I I had always been involved in sports and involved in competition, and when I got out of college, I didn't really have anything that was motivating me 
to, to train and, and stay active. And I, I'm the kind of person that really thrives on, um, on a goal. So for me just to go and work out, isn't something that I get all that excited about. So <laughs> I wasn't really working out. Um, I was working incredibly long hours. I, um, you know, I really threw myself into my job. I was traveling a lot and, and yeah, I was smoking, smoking two, one to two packs of cigarettes a day is really where I was at, at my, at my max, at my peak. peak smoke, <laughs> the peak top of your career. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I didn't have a single morsel of food in my refrigerator. All my meals were eaten out and it just, just wasn't really a place that I think that was sustainable long term. And, um, on a bet with a friend, I ended up going and, and doing a triathlon just kind of randomly, actually. I didn't even train for it, and I, you know, I went out and bought a wetsuit a couple of days before the race and, you know, rocked up to the, to the event, you know, smoking cigarettes on the way up there and just really <laughs> kind of doing it um, on a whim, and, and I ended up being just blown away by my experience. I was really inspired and motivated by... Um, really everything that I experienced that weekend just between seeing people of all ages and sizes, um, you know, just out there kind of doing this triathlon, which I actually found to be very intimidating and scary. I think that, you know, the mass start swim was something that made me quite anxious. And then to me at the time doing a 26 mile bike was just so like, I just felt so accomplished getting on my bike and doing something like that and then getting off and running. I mean, it was just such a big deal to me. And I don't think I really gave a lot of credence to it leading up to the race, but afterwards realized how, you know, how big of a deal it was and how awesome it was that so many people were out doing it. And I felt very inspired and, and at that point, um, pretty much quit smoking on the spot. I wouldn't say I did it quit smoking entirely. I, I would definitely go out and smoke a little bit here and there for, for several, several months after that. But, um, uh, for all intents and purposes, I quit smoking and, went and bought a bike, a Cervelo, which was my first bike I ever owned, and um, and started training and went and ended up doing, I ended up doing another race a few months later in, in Miami, and um, I improved. The first race I did, I was like three hours, and the second race I did, I was like 220, and I saw such a huge wow. improvement in my in my performance. Granted, they're different courses, but, but regardless, I mean, that's such a big improvement. I... Um, kind of got this bee in my bonnet that I was going to be like the next big thing at the Olympics and I was going to get win an Olympic gold medal and that I had all this potential. And, um, so that's kind of how it all started for me. I, I, you know, growing up as a elite athlete and kind of always dreaming of going into the Olympics that it, it kind of reinvigorated that, that dream of mine and, and had me kind of start taking the sport more seriously. So you really had that transformational experience that I think so many, so many amateurs and professionals have when you, you know, you, you have a go at the first triathlon and suddenly go, there's a whole new world here. And yeah, it's so great to hear your story being, I mean, I think there are so many people in triathlon who've come from that kind of, they enjoyed doing sport when they were younger, then they faded out and work pressures get to them and social pressures get to them and they fall into bad habits. And then something clicks one day and you go, you know, whether it's, the guy who's 47 and needs to lose some weight or whether it's someone who's a professional like yourself who thinks hang about a minute there's there's more to life than this how old were you at the time and and what sort of year was this put in a timeline for when when you did your first triathlon so that first uh one was in 2009 in june 2009 um and then i did the second one in september 2009 okay and then um and then i started training with you know being serious about my training in in 2010. Um, And so I started signing. I did a whole slew of races in 2010. I did my first half Ironman in 2010, which was the New Orleans 70.3. And which, as like a side note, that was my very first half Ironman. And it was also the first uh, win that I had as a professional. So it was that race has kind of a special place in my heart. Um, but, um, yeah, and then I quit pretty quickly actually qualified for my pro card um, and was quite intent on starting to race professionally, actually, in 2010. And <clears throat> I said, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to be the best in the world. And if I'm going to be the best in the world, I need to be coached by one of the best coaches in the world. So I 
you know, did all this research and I came up with a list of um, coaches that, and it, it was exhaustive, but it obviously didn't include, include everybody. Um, but I spoke to Cliff English. I spoke to, um, Andy Potts coach, Mike Doner, I think is his name. Um, I reached out to Brett Sutton. I re- I spoke to Simon Lessing. I spoke to Matt Dixon. Um, I spoke to, um, Phil Skiba. Um, I spoke to a, kind of a whole host of, of different, different coaches and, um, all of the coaches actually said, okay, well, or the ones that I heard back from some of them, I didn't actually hear back from, but all of them said, okay, like you can take your pro card. That sounds great. This is what I can do for you, blah, blah, blah. And Matt said, thanks, but no thanks. And by the way, I don't think you should take your pro card. And, um, that sort of Hmm. piqued my interest. I I wasn't expecting him to say, (laughs) say that, (laughs) you know, I thought he was going to say, Oh, you're the smoker, and all of a sudden, you know, you're not smoking. You seem to have all this potential and whatever. And he just pretty much like shut me down. And um, so I ended up flying out to San Francisco, and he said, "I have 15 minutes for you." And I'll never forget this this um, conversation. So we met outside a coffee shop, and we were sitting at a picnic table, and um, we were chatting. And he said, "Well, what do you want to achieve in the sport?" And I looked down and I said, I want to be world champion. And he said, look me in the eye and tell me that. And I looked him in the eye. I said, I want to be world champion. And he said after that meeting that he, he would coach me. He said that, um, meeting me in person was just kind of all he needed to really see that I had a lot of determination and, um, and grit and that he, you know, he felt like even though my results didn't scream anything with significant potential that he felt like I would be an athlete that, that would be worth, you know, worth his time to coach. So, um, we did start working together, but the one premise of us starting to, um, to have a coach athlete relationship was that I couldn't turn pro until he felt I was ready. Interesting. So I, I raced all of 2011 as an amateur. <clears throat> and the other thing he said was the only way that you can go pro is if you go out and you win everything as an amateur. So I raced all of 2011 as an amateur and, um, I won every single race with the exception of there was 170.3. I placed second amateur. Um, and then I did the 73.3 world championships and, and also, um, Kona and I didn't win overall amateur in those races. Um, you were fifth though. You were fifth in Kona your first year. Come on, let's, uh, (laughs) let's give you the credit that you were due, right? I mean, I had because I'm going to be like the nice interviewer here. Matt's been the, like Mr. Bad Cop. Yeah. I'm going to be good cop and go. But you were fifth yeah. in Kona, fifth overall amateur. That's awesome. And first American. And you're like, yeah, it wasn't that great because I didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but but after that race, he said, okay, you're ready. And so um, in 2011 in November, I I left my job and in New York city where I was working, I was working for HSBC securities there. And, um, I owned an apartment and I packed up my apartment and I sent everything into storage and I had about three bags and my bike, my bike box and, um, drove out to California and, and started training and racing full time beginning in 2012. Living the dream. Three bags and a bike. Hey. And so listen, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a fast story for us here because like pretty much that's the beginning for you, isn't it? You go to 70.3 New Orleans and you win that. And then yep. like, were you, were you happy with your first year as a pro? Did it go the way you wanted it to? Or were you looking at very much as like a, as a learning experience as a pro? Cause it's very different, isn't it? Racing pro than age group. Um, I think it was an interesting experience for me is, is probably the best way to describe it. I mean, I think that, Matt was, you know, he just kept on reinforcing to me the entire year. Like this, this year is about learning. This year is about gaining experience. This year is about, you know, not putting too much pressure on yourself. But I felt I was putting a lot of pressure on myself because I felt like I needed to validate this decision to have left a very lucrative, you know, stable career and, pretty much given it all up to go to go race professionally. So I had these really high expectations of myself from a performance perspective. And then not only that, that I had really been fortunate enough to secure some, some really dream sponsors for me. I mean, I was working with Cliff Bar and Shimano and Cervelo and, and Sockney from pretty much from day one. 
um, of my of my professional career. And you know, those are sponsors that people dream about having. And I had I had gotten them in my first year as a as a professional, and I felt this huge um, f- huge need to to prove to them that they had made the right decision in in working with me. And so, you know, I do feel like the first year was was definitely a huge learning experience, and I can look back and say that. But I also felt a lot of pressure and stress that first year to um, to really validate the the decision that that I made. Um, okay. And I actually ended up getting pretty burned out by the end of the year because I think I just put so much stress and pressure on myself that um, it was it was definitely a tough a tough year for me. Definitely a learning yeah. year, but a tough year. And again, like you were, you were 24th at the 70.3 world champs and you were 23rd in Kona as a pro. Yeah. So again, yeah. solid results as a pro. Um, but it, it sounds like it wasn't the, wasn't the kind of transition you were hoping for really. Yeah. And I think it wasn't, no, <laughs> it, it definitely <laughs> wasn't. I mean, I was hoping that I was going to come out and, and, and really perform a lot, a lot stronger than I did, but, but I didn't, um, but there was a lot that I learned and then carried with me into future years, which I mean, I think ultimately has really shaped and been a huge part and very instrumental to the rest of my career. So I look back now and I feel like that first year, you know, I wasn't like the superstar that some people end up being when they, when they have their rookie year. No, but, um, in terms of my own personal progression, it, it was this huge year for me and, and, and really influenced um, everything that we've done going forward. So that was good. And, and also, um, you know, with Kona that first year, again, like I had these really high expectations of myself to perform well. And Matt just said, you're racing here for experience. You're not racing here for placing. I don't want you to care about how you do. Of course I did care about how I did, but Mm. you know, he was very clear with me that, that I was going as sort of a celebration of, the strong year I had had, the fact that I even qualified as a first year pro type of thing. And, you know, looking back now, after that first year, um, the, the following year, I actually qualified for Kona, but I made the decision not to race because, you know, Matt said, okay, well, you had that experience racing in Kona. We go back and we'll race in Kona again when you're ready, you know, when you're ready to potentially crack the top 10. Yeah. So that second year, we didn't feel like I was actually developed as an athlete enough to potentially contend for a top 10 performance and so we made the decision to to not go to Kona that next year which was tough for me what do you think what do you think looking back was your or do you feel you have one like a like a breakthrough race as a pro during those years did you have one where you you were like this is it you know I've made the breakthrough now I felt as though my season as a whole uh, last in 2015 was um, it just every race I was like getting better and getting stronger and getting better and getting stronger. And I really felt as though Kona 2015, where I also placed seventh, uh, I felt like I raced up to my potential at that point in my career. Like I, that for me was my breakthrough race. I, prove to myself that I could compete at that highest level and contend. I felt like I proved to myself that I could actually perform at the levels that I thought that I could and, and, you know, execute in that sense. And, you know, it definitely gave me a lot of confidence. Um, I then went on to win my first Ironman um, eight weeks later at Ironman Western Australia. And, you know, those two races, I just felt like really set me up. Like I went into 2016 feeling like a totally different athlete mentally and, and also physically just, um, feeling like there was, there was a lot more in the tank and, and really prepared to kind of continue to evolve at, you know, and compete at this at a really high level. So I feel like, yeah, those, those two races combined were for me, probably my breakout. Sure. Sure. And so looking forwards, what do you, what do you feel like, you finished seventh twice now the last couple of years at the World Championship, yep. so you're a solid top 10 performer. What do you feel is the next step for you in order to making that breakthrough to get top five, top three, maybe even win in the coming couple of years? What's your plan going forwards and how are you going to address the things you think you need to address? Yeah. 
Well, I think uh, this year we we definitely learned a lot. Um, you know, I went into Kona this year with a goal and um, and my sights set on a podium, and I think that we walked away feeling like that that was a possibility. You know, I was prepared enough to to do that. I just didn't. I actually, I think I wanted it so bad this year, and I was putting so much pressure on myself that I ended up um, not kind of respecting the process of preparing for Kona and ended up going into the race tired. And sure. that wasn't actually Matt's doing at all. He was kind of like trying to pull back the reins, but I was like, no, no, I have to do more. I have to do more because I <laughs> wanted to, I wanted to get on a podium so bad, so badly. And, um, so, you know, Matt and do I you know what? I'm gonna... sat down the other day. <laughs> If, if you don't mind, I'm going to throw in a quote here that I found on, on triathlete.com as I was doing some research on you. It okay. says, uh, this, this is brilliant. Um, when I first started out, I'd get home from the office at two or three in the morning and get on my trainer and bike for an hour and a half and get an hour of sleep and then go back to the office. Yeah. I look back now and think that was just insane. So you've got the you've got the gene there, haven't you? The, the driven, like, I must do more to be better kind of gene going on. I do. And, and, so, I mean, to give you a little bit of a framework, I, I raced Ironman Vineman, which is at the end of July. And Matt said uh, to me, he said, okay, well, you can do this race. Like he, I had to kind of convince him to, to do it because I really wanted to race an Ironman. I'd, I'd been scheduled to race an Ironman earlier in the year, and I ended up um, having a little bit of a niggle and pulling out. And Matt said, well, you don't need to race an Ironman. I said, but I really want to. So I sort of convinced him to 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 do this this race at the end of July and he said that's fine but you have to be you have to be really patient and allow yourself to recover as we move into your Kona build because if we don't if you don't allow yourself to recover you're going to end up fatigued mm. and of course I won Ironman Vine Man and really had what I felt was probably my most complete performance that I had ever done and was so sort of motivated and excited by that performance, I just like totally ignored <laughs> everything that Matt said. It was just like went full force forward on gung ho training. Yeah, we've know. got to, we've got to mention here, right? It's fastest bike split, bike course record, fastest run split, and the run course record in that race. Yeah. So that's yes. pretty much domination, isn't it, by anybody's? And you must have come out of that going, "Bring it on! Let's go! Give me the build, Matt." I really, I mean, I really did, and I um. I was quite excited. I mean, my, my bike was in a amazing place at that point in the season and I had been, um, had a lower leg injury. And so actually my run build into the, that Ironman was, was not that significant. And I was really happy with the way that I ran. And so that just motivated me thinking, okay, well, if I actually get the run volume in and, and get the work in, then I'm like in a really good place to run under three hours in Kona, which is what I thought, you know, which was one of my targets. And so I just was hyper motivated. I just was so excited by, by that result. And I just felt so determined that this podium was like within my reach and totally over, you know, just put too, too much pressure on myself. And Matt had to have a few conversations with me during my Kona build. Like he was just like trying to talk me off the ledge. Cause I, I really was just, I was like too focused, which I know you can only sort of understand that when you're when you're in it or in kind of in the aftermath. But there's this fine balance between setting expectations and putting pressure on yourself and then putting too much pressure on yourself to the point that it's to your detriment. And I put too much pressure on myself to the point is my to my detriment. And I and I didn't perform in Kona um, to the expectations or sort of I didn't perform up to my my abilities. Um, yeah is what is what we felt and so but I learned from that like I learned a huge amount from that experience and um I probably walked away from that learning more than I would if I had um had everything go really well so you know heading into this year getting back to your original question um I think the number one thing for me is is staying um injury free like I always um seem to be a little susceptible to, to injury. And that's just something that I've had pretty much my whole life, even when I was younger. So I, you know, have to be really careful about that. And I think that the longer and I longer Matt and I work together, the more both he and I understand, you know, the signs and signals of when we need to back off a little bit. So staying injury free is, is key. But I think, you know, for me, um, 
I had a huge breakthrough in my swim this year. Um, I swam under an hour for the first time at Ironman Western Australia. And, you know, continuing to lower that gap in the swim is going to be really important for me. Um, Even if I can get, you know, a couple minutes more out of the swim closer to the front, that will be really important. Um, But I really believe it's beyond that. It's having a very strong, consistent bike and then running under three hours. You know, if you can, if you can, ride under five hours and then run under three hours you're setting yourself up very well for a podium performance and and so that that will be the you know a big focus for us this season so as someone who came to came to swimming relatively late and you're still doing the work to improve your swim (laughs) i know you train do you still train with jerry rodriguez at pier 26 uh, well, he's, I forgot he's that right. Is it Pier 26? Uh, Tower, tw- Tower 26. Tower 26. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, Tower 26, yep. Uh, so he's he's based down in L.A., and I now live um, up in Northern California where Matt is based so that I can train in front of Matt. So I don't see Jerry on a day-to-day basis like I, like I did for the first couple of years, um, but he's very much kind of part of the team of coaches and consultants that – that Matt and I use. Um, so, uh, for example, when we go to this Hawaii training camp in a couple of weeks, Jerry will be there. So, right. you know, I'll work with him. Then um, he and I speak uh, certainly every couple of months and usually after races, he and I will kind of debrief on the race and, and have conversations. Um, and I go down to LA from time to time to do um, some short training blocks with him. So, okay. Um, he's not as intimately involved as he was when I was down there, um, and living down there, but he's still, still very much part of, um, my progression and process. And what would be, I'm going to ask you this, what would be one tip that you could give to people who are trying to improve their swim as well? What's what, if you, if it is possible to boil it down then it probably isn't, but one thing that was really instrumental in you improving your swim so consistently. Uh, I think I actually think two things. I mean, I definitely think swimming with a squad is is extremely important. I think particularly if you don't like or swimming or you struggle with the motivation or it intimidates you a little bit, swimming with a squad just pushes you in a way that you definitely would not be able to push yourself. Um, you know, I feel like when I'm out biking, when I'm running, I do a pretty good job of pushing myself, but I get so much value from swimming with other people. Yeah. So that's one thing. And then I also think swimming open water is so key. Um, I think getting out and swimming twice a week is pretty much, I mean, I think that it will make leaps and bounds in people's open water swimming um, and performances. It's a very different thing to go and swim for an hour open water and then, or swim in a pool open water just because of all the flip turns. And, you know, it's like the difference between if you're in a pool and you're swimming hundreds versus be swimming in open water and just swimming for an hour straight. It's like the same thing as doing, I don't know, 200 yard meter repeats on the track versus going out for an hour and a half long endurance run. Like they both are beneficial, but you know, you definitely need the endurance run when you're preparing for a marathon too. So I just think that doing the open water is really key. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Cool. Hey, listen, to change tack very slightly, I want to ask you about something I came across on your website, which is, it's almost like a, a sub-website called thehabitproject.net, and it's focused on helping people change negative, I don't know what you described, was it negative addictions to positive ones? Is that Would that be a fair description habits, of how that works? Habits, habits yeah, rather than habits, addictions. Yeah. <laughs> it could be addictions. <laughs> yeah. Well, my company's called Oxygen Addict, so it's the same kind of, <laughs> yeah. it's the same kind of thing. Anyway, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, when I went and did my first triathlon, I, for a long time I had been really wanting to um, start leading a healthier life. I wanted, I actually wanted to start working out. I wanted to stop smoking. There were all these changes that I wanted to make, but I wasn't really that motivated or inspired to do it. And when I went and did that first triathlon, that was the exact trigger I needed and the exact motivation I needed to um, – to make the, the lasting changes that, that resulted in, in me stopping smoking and starting to be healthier and eat healthier and, and train more and do things like that. And it made me realize that uh, everybody has a trigger. You know, everybody has these bad habits, and of course they're really hard to change, but you have to actually be inspired and motivated enough to 
to, to change them. And you don't necessarily always know what that trigger or that motivation or that inspiration is going to be. And so the purpose of the habit project is to provide people with both a social community, but also sort of tips and challenges and, um, research and information around habit change that might help them and inspire them to, to make their own positive habit changes. And, and, you know, for most people, it's typically, you know, fitness related, nutrition related, or life balance related in terms of the habits that they're looking to improve upon. And so that's really where our focus is. And then we do um, also focus on triathlon just because it's so near and dear to my heart. It was what my trigger was. And also I just, you know, I love the sport so much that we, we incorporate that in there as well. So it's really, you know, it's geared towards trying to motivate and inspire positive habit change with people and, you know, sharing, um, sharing my story. And, um, I work with, uh, Jordan Blanco, who's my manager and, but also she's a friend of mine and, and, um, and training partner and, and Laurence Delisle, who's an amateur and, also a, a training partner of mine. And, um, you know, we've been working hard over the last, last couple of years to try to try to build it up and, um, still, you know, continuing to try to evolve it. I mean, this January we we each chose something that we feel that we, you know, a bad habit that we feel that we have and we're sort of documenting that so people can sort of follow us a lot, you know, and, and nice. follow how it's going and join us in that process. But yeah, the whole the whole point of it is just to promote positive habit change. Great. Well, people can go and check that out. Um, thehabitproject.net. Get over there, and it looks like there's some really good resources there as well. So uh, I'm going to hang out there and read some of your stuff later on when we're off air. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right. So listen, let's uh, let's wrap this up because I've kept you on here longer than I said that I would do. We'll, we'll kick over <laughs> to the finishing shoot here. We're going to do some quick fire questions and answers. What books had the biggest effect on you? Um, interestingly, I just read Siri Lindley's book surfacing and I oh, was it's good, very isn't it? moved by her book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just really blown away by it. I loved it. Um, it had a significant impact on me and I would recommend it to anybody. Um, you know, that's definitely probably one that I would, I would highlight. Have you heard the podcast that she did with Tony Robbins? No, I haven't. Oh, I didn't go and check that out. That. Yeah, Tony yeah, Robbins so interviewed her about two months ago on his podcast, and it moved me to tears as I was driving. I had to pull over. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know what he's well, like I, anyway, yeah, but I yeah, think, it was I was brilliant. blown away by her book, and, and I've always had a lot of respect for Siri. I mean, she's um, she's produced some really amazing results and has some great athletes and I think um you know she's done so much in terms of just what she did as an athlete and then obviously transitioning to the coaching but then reading what she wrote in her book was was amazing so yeah I, cool I loved it do you have a mantra that you say to yourself when when you're really hurting in races I'm a warrior or oh, be a warrior nice or I just say warrior. <laughs> you know, kind <laughs> of really where you're at in the race. But yeah. yeah, I mean I just feel like I feel like everybody has to bring out their little their inner warrior when they're when they're out there because we all hit, you know, some tough moments in the race and you've gotta gotta be strong. If you could only do one of the three sports, which one would it be and why? Running. I just I love to run. I I've always loved to run my whole life and it's just something where when I go out and I'm running, I can just completely get into my own headspace and I could just run and run and run. And it's just, it's sort of something that's kind of always been part of me. So I've actually, and I, and I say that I've actually really grown to love cycling so much. Like it's, it's right up there with running, but running still, still tops it. It's always the one. So many people answer that way. I love that. Yeah. And one training idea that you wish you'd known five years ago. <laughs> War is not always better. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, right there. <laughs> Write it on a post and stick it above the bed. That's it. That's all you need to know. More is not always better. Yeah. Apparently, I haven't quite learned that one yet, but but I'd like to think so. I mean, you and everybody else true. in the world, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, I, I always felt like I had to be getting in these long training weeks when I was working, and I think in retrospect, you know, people don't put enough enough value on rest recovery, <laughs> that so. should be that should be your hashtag on twitter we should get that trending around the triathlon world matt would have it printed on a t-shirt oh, for us i'm God. sure brilliant 
Listen, one final thing. I asked some Twitter questions if anyone had a question for you. And we got a question from Joe Skipper. And I love this. He said, do you enjoy hurting your training partners when you're training <laughs> hard with them? <laughs> uh, I do. Yeah, I do. Brilliant. I think um, I really put a lot of value on, on having training partners. And I, I'm i so appreciative of of their presence. Um, and I think that we, we mutually help one another, but, uh, you know, part of the point of having a training partner is for them to put the hurt on you and for you to put the hurt on them. And that's how you, that's how you get better. So, um, and I, I typically will do everything possible not to let people beat me. So, and I get satisfaction from that. So yes, is the answer. There you go. I love it. (laughs) all right well listen thank you uh, so much for taking the time for coming on the show and and i want to just thank you as well um sarah's very kindly donated one of her signed kits for our charity appeal for this year so thanks so much for doing that we really appreciate it you're very welcome I'm very happy to do that and we uh, we wish you all the best and and we'll be watching this season unfold for you with uh, with bated breath to see if you can crack that podium at kona this year really hope that you can thank you rob i appreciate that and i hope so as well so there you go right any any two pack a day cigarette smokers listening to this uh, this podcast at the moment who knows what might be lurking beneath the surface i know and think of jane handsome as well yeah yeah you it know? just goes to show absolutely i i yeah, I've, I've um i love sarah's story i think it's really really cool and i love the fact that oh she um yeah she's done so well with it as well it's mm. great and you know what she's such a nice person as well i mentioned after the interview about our uh, our charity appeal and the fact we were doing the, the prize draw and she said yeah absolutely i'll send you one of my race kits over and sign it for you and literally two days later by express priority mail at a significant cost to her according to the postage thing her signed race suit turned up on my doorstep ready for the charity the charity prize draw which i just think is it's so rare in this life that somebody like they'll say they'll do something and then they follow up with it straight away do you know what yeah. i mean just yep. think she's an absolute diamond so i want to that's earned her some good karma in my book for this year that's really cool and it looks a very nifty suit so if you want to check mm. it out i know that um it's on uh twitter feeds it's at o a try podcast um on twitter and also get behind um the charity fundraiser rob's charity fundraiser it's just giving.com forward slash crowdfunding forward slash podcast that's right you donate 20 pounds you get a ticket for the draw and 50 pounds even gets you three tickets for it and we've got some super super cool prizes on there so watch this space for more news about that um and that hells is pretty much it for this week isn't it we're gonna have to wrap it up just one last thing from me um i'm doing a webinar this week with training peaks on thursday the 26th of january at 9 30 p.m uk time triathlon training for the time crunched age grouper i'll put the link in the show notes to that or there's various bits that training peaks are, uh, are posting at the moment on social media so just click the link and sign up and if you can't attend live you'll get a, a link to the replay after afterwards as well so if you want some training tips the idea is i'm going to do a little short presentation then it's going to be a face-to-face q a over like a video call so we haven't tried it before we'll see how it goes and uh, the guys at training peaks are, are really excited to try something new so any triathlon training questions it's going to be like a live face-to-face coach's couch brilliant love it good luck with that and uh, thank keep, you all. keep up the good work with uh, training and uh, we will speak to you again next week we shall so until next week i'm coach rob wilby i'm helen murray and our sponsors have been tgstore.co.uk precisionhydration.com and team.oxygenaddict.com have a great training and racing week fire us some uh, some comments over onto twitter and we'll we'll catch up with you all again next week all right thanks everyone bye now